Yo, what's going on, badass? It is your friendly neighborhood Tim Burzens here from Amplified Metabolism, of course. And today's topic is something that I'm really excited about because it's so important for your metabolism. It has a very overarching uh, breadth of connections within your body. And that is how to increase your carbon dioxide levels or your CO2 levels. Now, that might sound kind of odd. A lot of people think of carbon dioxide as something you breathe out and not something that you need and that oxygen is good and carbon dioxide is bad or something like that. It couldn't be further from the truth. It's actually that carbon dioxide is a metabolic byproduct from efficient energy production in your cells. In Ignite Your Metabolism, the course that I just released, we talk a lot about CO2 in there um, because CO2 is so important for so many things. But really what we're talking about is the three different energy production systems, fat burning, uh, glycolysis of carbs and oxidation of carbs. Um, those three have different metabolic byproducts that get created. And those metabolic byproducts help to signal the rest of your body what's happening, what's going on, and whether you should whether the rest of the shells, cells should respond by increasing metabolism, decreasing it, acting in different ways because all of the cells have to work coherently as an organism. And so they all communicate through those metabolic byproducts. So oxidation of glucose, which is that oxidative metabolism, produces the most CO2. And that, that's why CO2 has so many good benefits in the body. Fat burning is less CO2. It's about two thirds the amount that carbs do. And then the glycolytic carbs that produce lactic acid produce no CO2, not good. So with that little brief introduction out of the way, increasing CO2, what are the benefits? Why do we want to do it in the actual practical sense? What are the benefits? So first of all, it's very anti-inflammatory. Um, it helps to reduce stress, reduce inflammation, um, you know, pre prevent that prostaglandin synthesis of um, you know, the negative prostaglandins that cause all the inflammation and stuff like that. Um, in addition to that, it's also really, really important for bone health, for calcium regulation. And the reason is when carbon dioxide is produced in the cell, it will bind any excess calcium that is negatively affecting the mitochondria's ability to produce energy, and it will take it out of the cell because carbon dioxide is acidic. Uh, the ionized calcium is more alkaline. Carbon dioxide binds it, takes it out of the cell. But not only that, it's also really important for actually storing that calcium into bone and not into soft tissue because carbon dioxide activates the vitamin K dependent enzymes that vitamin A and D produce. And that's a whole other tangent that we're not gonna get into today. The point is more carbon dioxide, better calcium regulation, better ion, cell ion regulation overall, which is very, very important for making sure your metabolism is working efficiently. And the final benefit, which might actually be the most important probably, is the fact that oxygen cannot get into the cells, oxygen cannot get transported in the blood, oxygen cannot get transferred between the lungs and your air without carbon dioxide. There are these two effects called the Bohr effect and the Haldane effect, and those two work together to basically say that if you want to get oxygen somewhere, you need to exchange it with carbon dioxide in order to transport it through and get it you know, where you want it to go. So in other words, more carbon dioxide, more oxygen gets into the cell, more oxidative metabolism happens, which creates more carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide brings in more oxygen, which is, you know, it's a positive spiral, it just goes and goes and goes and goes and goes. So carbon dioxide, super important. Now, what are the best ways to in increase it? How do we increase carbon dioxide? There's a lot of crazy methods out there. Some of them are really cool. Some of them work really well. Some of them are a little bit crazy. Um, you know, weird techniques that you might be like, why would I, would I do that? It's kind of like odd. I'll go over a few of them right now that are kind of, they're, they're effective, but they're not my go-to. They're not what I really like to always recommend to people. Um, the first one is, is buteco breathing, which is basically like a way of controlling. Uh, I don't even know if I'm saying that right, but um, it's the way, a way of controlling your breath so that you actually breathe less. And that creates a buildup of carbon dioxide um, I don't like that one as much because, you know, lack of oxygen in your body might increase the CO2 component, but it's actually anti-thyroid because you need that oxygen to get into the cell. So increasing carbon dioxide at the expense of oxygen is not really good. We want to increase carbon dioxide so that the efficiency of oxygen is improved. And that's actually what you see with people who live in high altitudes because the pressure of oxygen in the air is lower. Their bodies naturally create more CO2 and hold on to CO2 better and that increases the efficiency of oxygen, but they're not really deprived of oxygen. It's just that they're able to increase the content of their CO2. So similarly, you can rebreathe. Basically, any carbon dioxide you breathe out, you breathe back in. Uh, you can do this easily with bag breathing. If you take a plastic, or um, not a plastic bag, that would kill you. If you, take, if you take a paper bag, put it over your mouth and your nose, keep a tight seal, 
and breathe into it for five, 10 minutes. You'll start to feel it gets hard. You start breathing a little heavier. Basically what's happening is you're breathing, rebreathing back in that carbon dioxide and it's helping to raise the levels naturally in your body. Now, because we just talked about that positive spiral and then there's also the negative stress spiral that's affecting it downward. Um, because it's a positive spiral like that, the reason that it can be effective is you do five, 10 minutes, real short time, increase your CO2 levels basically to start the spiral and then it can keep going from there on its own, hopefully. Um, doesn't work in all cases, but the point is those short little sessions can be effective. And similarly, you can also drink baking soda, which tastes absolutely terrible. I don't know if you've ever tried it before, but it's not a good flavor. Um, basically the way that works is that sodium bicarbonate, baking soda, bicarbonate is two carbon dioxide molecules um, paired together. It is the, uh, let's see, it's the Lewis base form of the acidic carbon dioxide. I believe I'm doing that right. I might not be though. Um, and in your body, it's a buffer system. The amount of CO2 is acidic. The carbonate is, uh, you know, alkaline. The two help to balance each other out. So your body can convert carbon dioxide into carbonate if it wants to. And it can also take carbonate and turn it into carbon dioxide if it needs to. Um, the problem with that is that if you take a lot of it, which is very beneficial in general, uh, baking soda is very fit beneficial. There's also been like some studies showing that like strength increases are crazy. Um, and I've messed around with that a little bit too. And I, I did notice some improvements in the gym. So worth trying. The problem is you can over alkalinize your blood, which can be bad for calcium regulation. I remember I said that, you know, when you have the acidic CO2 pulling the calcium out of the cells, that's a good thing. But if you have too much alkalinity in your blood, then the calcium can't stay bound in the blood in the blood. So it ends up getting stuck in the tissues. Um, you can easily measure that with a little pH strips and just pee on them and see what they, they say. But that's kind of, you know, that's an, that's an extreme method. I don't want all of you going out there measuring the pH of your pee all the time. You know, we all have lives. That's not really how we want to spend our time. I've even tried nebulizing baking soda, which works very well as well. Um, basically, one of the problems with ingesting baking soda is that your stomach acid is really acidic and it, it can bind to that carbonate, creating CO2 in your stomach, which you then burp out and then you don't actually absorb it. So in order to increase that, increase that, you can nebulize it, which is basically takes the soluble, uh, the soluble baking soda that is dissolved in water, turns it into these tiny little droplets that you breathe in. Usually it's used for like medicine, like another way to ingest medicine of some sort, but you can do it with baking soda too. Basically your lungs are absorbing the sodium bicarbonate and that works really well for what it is, but you still run into those same problems where you're over alkalinizing the blood. So you have to be careful with it um, and kind of understand where you're at. Eating a high protein diet can also help to counterbalance that. So you can do more of the sodium bicarbonate if you want to. And that's a good option. However, all of those methods, while they're good, they're, you know, they're all kind of weird. It's not like you normally would do that. They're also not really affecting the base level that we really want to improve. It's kind of like working up here in this higher level, kind of like the byproduct and hoping that it takes hold into your metabolism and ramps it up. But honestly, if you're correcting the bottom layer of your metabolism, it shouldn't really matter whether you're doing all this other stuff to maintain your CO2 because your body's just going to be churning out lots and lots of CO2 naturally. And the other benefit of that is that it's produced in the cell. And if the CO2 is produced in the cell, that's when it really has those powerful effects for pulling calcium out of the cell and maintaining that cellular ion gradient. That is so important. So then the question becomes, how do you create more CO2 naturally? Not just holding onto it, but how do you like create more CO2? And the answer is, uh, I have three things here. The first one is carbohydrate, but specifically sugar. So we mentioned before that the uh, oxidative phosphorylation energy pathway of glucose produces the most CO2. Fatty acid burning produces two thirds the amount, much less of, a, of a, an effect for creating that CO2. So we really wanna focus primarily on trying to get the oxidative metabolism of carbohydrate. Now, the reason sugar is so important is because even if you have any degree of insulin, insulin resistance, which most people in the low metabolism state do have, sugar will bypass that insulin sensitivity because fructose does not need insulin to be absorbed. And because of that, it goes straight into the cells, starts going through the energy processes and kicks off that glucose cellular machinery for the oxidative phosphorylation pathway, producing more CO2 and starting that upward spiral that we want so badly. So sugar is really, really good. Second thing is uh, exercise. Now, I don't really like the long endurance exercise. I think that's too stressful. I think it causes you to uh, actually lose too much CO2 because you're hyperventilating and you're actually producing lactic acid for a long time, for like half an hour, 45 minutes, hour, whatever. I prefer to either go extreme with the heavy weightlifting, really, really heavy, short sets, um, you know, 
good amount of rest between them. You do produce some lactic acid, but it's much less on the whole because they're just the short, short sets and you get to recover from them. Either staying on the weightlifting side and that's, and building muscle, which, you know, also good for bone health and calcium regulation, of course, or on the other end, low intensity stuff, standing at your desk, walking, um, all the stuff that basically doesn't cause a stress response, but does ramp up some energy production in your cells so that you can be producing more of that CO2. Um, and for the record, you know, whenever I, I know that if my calcium regulation is off and, I, uh, and I'm storing calcium in my um, tissues, my hands and my feet freeze up. It's like an instant stress response, I can tell. But if I go for a walk, then, you know, that CO2 gets created, pulls that calcium out. I can feel my hands and feet warm up, but they stay warm for hours afterwards. It's kind of like it kicks it off uh, in that positive spiral that we've been talking about. So if, if you're going to use exercise, I definitely recommend either doing, you know, your, your hard weightlifting workouts, build some muscle, build your bones, or stick to the low intensity, do walking, standing at your desk, trying to be a little bit more active, produce that extra CO2. Now the third and final way is thyroid hormone. So thyroid hormone is the uh, hormone that basically tells your entire body, all of your cells, all of your tissues, where its metabolic rate should be, how much energy it should produ be producing. And I really like to view it more as like a, an abundance hormone, you know, like back in caveman days or whatever, uh, we would either have times of famine, we would have times of abundance when there's lots of food and basically thyroid hormone is telling your body how much food there is available. And if there's lots of food av available, it's going to be going through the oxidative phosphorylation pathways. All the healthy hormones are going to be boosted. The protective hormones are going to be boosted and it's all good. In times of famine, thyroid hormone goes down. You start burning less calories. You start to lower your body temperature. Um, basically without thyroid, your body's telling, okay, not food around. Let's re preserve calories and try to hold on to it. Um, but thyroid, the big thing is it increases that oxidative phosphorylation in all of your cells. And because of that, you cre create more CO2 overall and get all the benefits. It's kind of like a CO2 and thyroid kind of work together. They're like partners and they both kind of build on each other and help to create, spiral up that metabolism. So those are kind of the main things I would focus on. If you want to try the bag breathing, it's a nice quick little thing that can jolt you up. If you work on the, if you want to try the baking soda, that's a good option too. Just make sure you don't overdo it. Um, like I said, that has some strength benefits too from certain research studies that show that. Um, but the main ones, eat more carbs, especially sugar, exercise, and try to get that thyroid up. Um, it's all, and always remember the importance of that, that positive spiral. The fact that CO2 will only be effective, increasing your CO2 will only be effective if it sticks. Basically, like if your negative spiral is stronger than your, your positive spiral and it's pushing it down and you try to bump it up with CO2, but the negative spiral is still stronger, it's going to keep pushing your metabolism down. You might get a little jolt, but then it comes back down. The key is to try to do enough to get the CO2 up enough and all the other hormones up like thyroid hormone and um, providing enough sugar and all that stuff to initiate that positive spiral so that the positive spiral is dominant and you're pushing your metabolism up more and more and more. I'm going to do a video on this one soon. So um, that's the spiral thing will make a lot more sense when I do that. So that is all I have for you guys today. Hopefully you enjoy the video. Um, try to get that CO2 up, try to increase the amount of carbon dioxide you're producing through the oxidative phosphorylation pathway so that you are able to boost your metabolism, give yourself all those positive biofeedback signals, pull the calcium out of the cell, keep the anti-inflammatory, increase oxygen uptake, all the good stuff that we want that is related to a high metabolism. As always, please like, share, and subscribe if you like this video. I'm trying to get this information out to as many people as I can. If you haven't taken the metabolism quiz yet, take it right now. It's in the link below. Um, it's awesome. It'll tell you where you are, where you are on the metabolism spectrum and then give you some further uh, notes on what the next step needs to be for you. Um, please subscribe to my videos. You can do that here. I'll put a little link. If you're interested in my full course on all of this stuff with uh, metabolism, how to boost it, how to raise it, um, check out in the description a link for my program Ignite Your Metabolism, which just came out recently. It's been getting tons of great reviews. Um, if you're interested in that, just check it out below. And as always, thank you for watching these videos. This is the reason I do it. I want to help you. I want to help get this information out, help your metabolism. And with that, I'm out. Peace.